jump right into it. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, and thanks for the OWASP committee for uh, allowing myself and Ethan to present uh, this Friday afternoon. We're super excited. And my coworker, Alex, is going to be joining on the presentation as well. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get right into it. So Data Theorem, we uh, focus on API security, web security, cloud uh, security, and mobile. Um, but uh, a couple years ago, uh, I've, I've been uh, a pen tester. And before a pen tester, uh, in the 90s, I did some other things that didn't really have a, a cool title, but I've been in the hacking scene for quite some time. And about two years ago, uh, I noticed some attacks happening on APIs that were, I thought, coincidental. Um, and it turned out it wasn't. It was some pretty cool techniques that are still happening today. Uh, so that is the topic of my talk is not only how to hack your APIs in 15 minutes or less, how hackers right now are doing it in 15 minutes or less. So this is more like a case study of what I identified from some reconnaissance and some of my friends still in the industry uh, with uh, unknown titles. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it. Um, and then uh, I'm going to just dive right in. So, so one thing I want to talk about, the main um, importance of this slide is 15 minutes or less. The hacker community, and I'm not talking about the research community, or even the professional community like Data Theorem, but the hacker community is quite efficient. They have a lot of things to do, uh, whether it's hanging out with friends, uh, trying to get their driver's license, or, or even a bag of Cheetos. Uh, they're a very efficient crew. And so 15 minutes for a target, unless you want to take down that target, or unless it's a nation state, 15 minutes, it's about the maximum time you're going to have a, a hacker going after you uh, for like a drive-by attack. Uh, and, the, and that's what my first thing is hackers hack right that's what they're here for that's what they want to do uh they do it for fame sometimes it's for chaos sometimes they entertain themselves and their friends and sometimes for money now later uh when you know in the past decade it's become monetizable but in the 90s no one was really making money off of hacking organized crime was always there but it's gotten even more efficient um but this is something that you know hackers are here to hack um but, uh, but it's different from research. Um, research is very different from hacking, uh, security research that is. Uh, so one person on our board uh, who don't, doesn't need an introduction, Dan Bonet, um, he's a professor here at Stanford. Um, he's a true researcher. He has taught me so much uh, about the information security community, I mean, uh, information security uh, market. Um, and his students over at Stanford, his PhD students, they're great research, they produce great things, but it's research of security, it's not hacking. And so because I grew up in this uh, world uh, in the 90s, uh, the researchers are what I call the Diet Coke of evil. Like uh, many researchers would never ever uh, break a law, where they would never maybe even hack itself, which is, uh, which is actually pretty easy with test environments and the cloud these days, you don't really have to choose a target to learn. There's so many other places to learn. But it is not an evil thing um, to do in security research. Um, you're not breaking any laws. Uh, but when I was much younger uh, in the 90s, uh, we didn't have that luxury. Uh, it was a hacking community. There were no test environments. And so my friends, because I, I kind of call out post-2015 security is really strongly and more technically research-based. Uh, but sometimes I'm known to be a grumpy old man saying, hey, if you've never hacked anything, um, it, it's a different mindset of hacking. Uh, it's about efficiency, it's about data, and it's about, you know, getting in and getting out. It's not for the intellectual stimulation. It's not for the research. It's a very different reasons. Um, and this is what I identified with this API hack that, that we'll be talking about today. All right. So before I talk about that, um, let me talk to you about some of uh, uh, Dr. Dan Bonet's uh, research and other research from the uh, academic community. So this I thought was pretty clever and kind of distinguishes a hacker from a researcher. Here is a great paper uh, from some universities of how uh, machine learning can be defeated, essentially. So you and I and everyone probably watching this is probably seeing a stop sign. It's pretty international. Maybe the language changes across the globe. Uh, but the, uh, the stop sign is pretty, uh, at least here in the United States, pretty known to all of us. We all would say this is a stop sign. 
Believe it or not, these stickers on the stop sign make certain um, machine er learning algorithms not recognize this anymore as a stop sign. So this no longer looks like a stop sign to some machine learning algorithms. And the great students of these universities basically did this intellectual research to basically prove machine learning can be defeated. Yes, machine learning can be defeated with four stickers on the stop sign. Very impressive, very impressive. So uh, someone like me, um, when I was much younger, or maybe even today, what I would do is probably not take months of research from very intelligent students from great universities. Uh, what I'm gonna do uh, to defeat uh, machine learning is I'm gonna take a stop sign and I'm gonna go sit on 101. Um, and if you're here in California near Silicon Valley, 101 is our major highway here. Um, and I will just stand um, in, you know, the middle of the highway with a stop sign. And you can see a Tesla here. I'm not picking on Tesla. Um, it could be any smart automobile that recognizes uh, the, uh, the promise of self-driving cars, which I love and I will happily do one day. Uh, but self-driving cars will see stop signs and they will stop. So what happens if they see a, a stop sign on a highway? Um, will they know that uh, an immature adult like myself is holding the stop sign and just ignore it, which is the safe thing to do? Or are they gonna continue and listen um, to the stop sign and stop on 101? Um, and so you might be saying, or some, maybe someone on Tesla is saying, wait, listen, listen, we figured this out. We know we're on 101. We know we're, on, we're going 65 miles per hour. We know there is no way there's a stop sign here because we know this highway, this will not be possible. And I don't know if that's true. Maybe someone in the audience does. In the Slack channel afterwards, I would love to hear about more. Uh, but let's say, you know, let's say that's true, right? Let's, uh, but we'll look at this construction worker. This construction worker is on a small highway somewhere probably in the Midwest here in the United States. Um, and they're doing some construction work. Uh, it might be emergency uh, construction work. So how, what is the difference of me on 101 with a stop sign and this construction worker on a stop sign, right? Um, do this, you know, this is, this is like real time emergency road work and this construction worker is obviously stopping cars, right? So, so this is my, my, my answer to like the 15 minutes when you're a hacker, you're not trying to defeat TLS. That's like multiple months of research, if not years, you're trying to hack and get data. Um, so so the, 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 the point I'm gonna make next will really come full circle with API security because of the recent data breaches we've seen in the last three years with APIs. Um, it's not sophisticated, it's hackers running wild on API security, and here's what they're doing. Um, so don't listen to me, don't listen to the data theorem, look at the news, look at the data. So uh, two years ago, there was this app called 63 Red Safe. it's a mobile app, um, and essentially um, it was in the news uh, because an API that the mobile client was connecting to um, had no authentication required. Uh, so this happened in March 12th of 2019. My company, Data Theorem, um, we found out about it because it involves mobile and API. So we're like, oh, interesting. Now we obviously look for that con con constantly since uh, 2016, but it was cool to see that the awareness of API security was getting out there as it pertains to mobile or not mobile. But here's the interesting part. Um, later that year, the exact same thing happened with the exact same researcher. Here's an app um, in Australia with an API search operation. The other one was a, a different operation. This is a search operation also in a mobile app, and the attacker was able to get the first name, last name, email, date of birth, Facebook ID, and phone numbers all through an open API out there on the internet, right? September 19th, or September 9th. September 27th, three weeks later, same attack, different app. Same attack, different app. This is Heyo, this is an Elasticsearch database embedded in the mobile app also identified by a hacker, also publicized here in the news. December 23rd of the same year, again, same attack, API, uh, API response operation embedded in a mobile app um, and also compromised first name, zip code, basically location information 
um, just a, a couple months later. So at this point, it's not a coincidence to me. At this point, I know someone, either a group of hackers uh, or researchers, what they call themselves now, are figuring stuff out. Um, they're, they're putting things together either as a group itself or as a copycat attack, but there's too many attacks on the API targeting mobile clients and successful all at the same time, right? No one's that lucky all the time. Um, so it goes on to the next year, our favorite year, 2020, the year of COVID um, and uh, June of 2020, it could go on and on. But here's something just two weeks ago. Uh, Mom, this is also in the news on September 17th, so the, this, uh, this paper, um, this article came out saying, APIs lacking authentication controls can allow anyone, including threat actors, to potentially hit sensitive information. And two thirds, if you read the title of this article, two thirds of um, uh, misconfigured API, I'm sorry, two thirds of cloud breaches, which is why we're also a cloud company, not as API. Two thirds of cloud breaches are because of misconfigured APIs. And I'm gonna show you how that's successful. That's the whole point of our talk today is that is something we've been knowing, knowing about 2016. This hacker group in 2019 knew about it two years ago. And now the rest of us are catching up, um, obviously, obviously this article. And one thing, if you're into API security, you're probably something aware of the BOLA attack. Bro broken object uh, something authentication. It's a great attack, I love it. Very sophisticated, very research oriented, right? Um, and that's why I'm not gonna talk about it today because it's not the cause of data breaches. Data breaches are happening much ha much easier uh, than BOLA. Now BOLA is great, I love it, but it's a researcher exploit. Um, APIs uh, are being breached in a much easier way. And you can see from this article, uh, two thirds of cloud data breaches are because of the API. So I cannot agree with uh, that more. Okay, so how how did this happen? All right, so this is the this is the cool stuff, right? So um, this is what I re uh, that I figured out back in 2019 was happening. So this is what uh, that you can do yourself, and we're going to provide some tools to uh, to allow you to do it yourself as well. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the app store. Um, there's a lot of ways to do this, but I'm going to talk about how to, how to do this, how the hackers did it in 2019. Um, we're going to go to the App Store. And we're going to download any app we want. I'm choosing Amazon because it's a random name that I remembered this morning. There's nothing wrong with Amazon. There's nothing wrong with the app. This is just, just an app on the App Store. So the first thing we're going to do is take an app from the App Store, and we got to decrypt it. Um, that's step number one. Um, and here's a, a screenshot of us decrypting it. And I'm going to now share um, uh, a video of us doing that so you can see it in real time. So I'm going to switch back and forth uh, for your uh, pleasure. Um, so, so this is us decrypting uh, the Amazon app. The Amazon app is on the right side on the iPad, and then the left side is our code. And when we're decrypting it, which is um, depending on what technologies you have or how comfortable you're with, it's not very difficult, right? So decrypting an app from the App Store, uh, removing the DRM, something pretty standard. And so, so that's done here. Um, so that's all decrypted. And now we're going to take the decrypted app and put it on our uh, analyzer farm. So I'm going to go back uh, to the PowerPoint. All right. Now, step two is detecting uh, and basically decompiling the app to get to its source code. Remember, this is a binary in a public cloud. We call it the App Store, but it's still a public cloud. So we took Amazon's app from the App Store, it could be Netflix, could be anyone, and we're gonna decompile it, and now we're gonna go and hunt for APIs. So my coworker, Ethan, who's gonna take over in a second, wrote this tool called API Hunter. We're gonna release it to you all uh, uh, to use and play with afterwards. Um, he wrote a tool called API Hunter that essentially is gonna look for APIs in the Amazon app, right? Very simple. So I'm gonna just show that in action. So give me a quick second. All right, so here's Ethan's tool. Uh, and so now what he's gonna do is, you can see at the top, uh, API Hunter is gonna be executed on the Amazon app. Um, little typo there. And now he's hunting. He's uh, not threat hunting, he's API hunting. 
So all the APIs that he's identified on the Amazon app from its public binary are showing up here in uh, light green. And, uh, and again, we're gonna show you how to automate this together. But so far we've done nothing special, nothing new, no BOLA attacks, all very simple stuff, right? Um, going through it step by step, just so you all know. And so I'm gonna go back to my slides. So, so far we've taken the app from the App Store, we ran API Hunter on it, and we got some APIs, right? All good. Now, here's the clever part. This is the clever part, and I applaud this hacker group that do the, this two years, because remember what I said about efficiency in the beginning of this? What they did is they took the Amazon or any app today, and they sat on it. They didn't do anything, and this is clever. This is why hackers are very efficient. And then the next release of the app, or maybe three releases now, they did a diff. Um, and they looked at the app from three months ago to today, and then they figured out what's new. What are the new APIs? And this is why hackers are so clever. The reason they were targeting only the new APIs in a big or large organization, or in big or small organization, what's usually going out the door has a, liar, a higher success ratio of being hacked than something that's been in the app for years, right? And the reason about that is because developers have a lot of control now. They can push out code and the security team may be behind if it doesn't have a product to look at that code in real time. It could be missing new APIs are happening or they're being released out to the public. So if you're a hacker and you wanna get in and get out and not waste your time, you're gonna target the new APIs only and not the old ones. Because the success uh, rate of a targeting new APIs is much higher than something that's been there forever. So, so um, Ethan has done that as well. So let me go ahead and show that. Sorry, let me just share that slide. All right, so this is a demo of his tool. And now he's uh, basically finding the new APIs, the brand new APIs uh, from um, diffing the old Amazon app here in April to the one from today. And so the only thing that his tool is gonna show is the new stuff from today. And this is what you're gonna target with your attack script to go basically get some large amounts of data. So this is all automated, like this is all the new attack surface, bam, I have a new attack surface and the likelihood that I can attack this is much higher than something again that's been there forever. All right. All right. So at this point, all you have to do is connect to the APIs. You connect to the APIs. Now this is the sample part. The next part I'm showing you is all sample. Uh, this is, has nothing to do with the Amazon app, but this is the type of data those hackers were getting in 2019 and 2020. They were getting first name, last name, username, password, password has, social security number. All they did is do a diff of the binary, found the new APIs immediately, connected to those new APIs, and bam, they compromised large portions of data. So that article I showed you have two thirds of data breaches are happening on the cloud because of APIs. This is how it's happening. It's not some sophisticated multi-step triple bank shop BOLA attack. It's hackers targeting the brand new stuff, the stuff that's straight off the assembly line, connecting to them at scale and getting data at, uh, uh, that can be sensitive. Not all, all the data is gonna be sensitive, but the data that they're getting uh, one out of 10 and they just need to have it once is gonna be, uh, is, is for their case, sensitive. And so the beauty of this is attack is if you're a hacker, um, what did you do? You decrypted, you diffed, you connected, you extract, you can script that. Like I showed it to you one by one, but you can script that to do it automatically. And then you can target literally millions of APIs, millions of mobile apps on the App Store and Play Store, millions of single page app and server apps. The attack target is so huge that if you don't target one company, you can target thousands and millions with this script. And again, this is what the hacker community was doing for API security. 
Um, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit and I hand it over to Ethan to talk about the science of these tools. We're going to release these tools uh, right after this talk. So Ethan, would you mind talking about the details of these, please? Yeah, thanks, Amanchu. So what we're looking at here is the Python script that performs that initial analysis that you showed where we find all of the APIs within the decrypted application bundle. And like you said, Amanchu, this is, this is really easy stuff. There's nothing complex here. So what the script is doing, we look at every file that's within an application bundle. Applications are made up of a lot of files, binary files, SDKs, text files, images. We'll search through every file within that application bundle and use the strings command to dump the list of strings that are in each of those files. So that gets us the entire list of strings within each of those files in the bundle. Now from there, we're going to use a regex expression against those strings to narrow that full list of strings down to items that look like they might be APIs. Uh, they have HTTP, HTTPS, colon, they follow the general URL format. Now, we don't need them to have API or any specific keywords in there to look for it. The regex expression is pretty comprehensive in that. So when we run this against the application bundle, it prints out the list of every single uh, URL within the bundle that looks like it may be an API. But keep in mind, this is a simple regex expression. So we, we don't expect the results to be perfect. We expect some of the findings that we get out of this to um, you know, maybe they're not reachable or anything. So that's why it's important to follow up this step by attempting to connect to each of those APIs that you found. So what we're seeing here is, um, you know, kind of a flow chart that describes, uh, you know, given a potential API, if a connection is made to that API and the resulting status code is 404 not found, well, that means we can ignore it. It's not a real API. It's not reachable. It's a waste of time, right? Now, if it redirects or we get some other type of server error, those are also uh, indicators that this is not a real URL or a real API. Now, if we get a 200 to 209, that's all good, right? That means that we were able to connect successfully, no problems. If we get a 403, which is an authentication error, that's still a green light. If we get a 403, that means that we found a real API and we tried to connect to it, and it just told us, no, you can't connect here without a password. Remember, we're doing API inventory here. So we only care about figuring out which APIs are, are real and valid, not necessarily worrying about the authentication scheme of them. Those can come later. All right, so another example of running that Python script that I just described against an app bundle. And you can see here that pointed it to the, an application called Apollo.app. And it printed out all of these strings that look to be uh, APIs. These are in specific for the Reddit website. But um, you'll notice not all of them contain API. Some of them have uh, weird formatting. Some of them may not be URLs. So again, that's why it's important to connect to these to validate. Oops, sorry. All right. So what we're looking at here is the output, like, like Montre said, shadow APIs are a great target if you want to uh, you know, save time and only target impactful new APIs. And the way you find these is using that same script I just described to dump the list of APIs out of uh, you know, one version of the application. You're going to do the exact same thing, but with a different version of the application. So there is a requirement here that you've held on to uh, you know, a decrypted version of this app. It's a little bit older than the one you have now. And you're able to run the script against both of those bundles. And then with the resulting uh, URLs you get from each of these, you diff them. And the diff is the net new APIs, APIs that have been recently added to the application. And like Amanchu said, there was a probably a lot less scrutiny on the APIs that just popped up in apps yesterday versus the APIs that have been in the application since it shipped a few years ago. So if a hacker is really trying to save time and you know root someone in 15 minutes or less, targeting these shadow APIs is really a, a great strategy to go towards. Yeah, and thank you, Ethan. And, and, and this technique is not new. Um, Emma, what, what Ethan and the team observed and what we found from the hacker community and what we do at Data Theorem is cool stuff on new API tech. But this technique actually came from the 90s. Like, uh, uh, if I can date myself, when a Microsoft, and yes, uh, that used to be an operating system that everyone used, um, when they used to come up with a service pack, what you do is you take that service pack and you essentially look at what the service pack is updating in the OS. 
And that's where you know to look for if there's any security changes in the OS. And that's how you know there's an exploit. And if you're if you're a gray hat, um, you're essentially right a worm in the 90s. And that's how all these worms became successful because Service Pack 2, Service Pack 3 would patch a security issue and um, and no one upgraded service packs for six months and hence you have a worm. So this technique is not new. It's just being applied on APIs now within 15 minutes. And you can see from 2019 to all the way to two weeks ago, it's still successful. So so in summary, um, the way to to make sure you as a researcher uh, can find this, use our tools or use this technique uh, uh, and, and, and implement this, don't stop doing security research. We do it all the time, but don't forget about the efficient hacker. They want data, they get in, they get out, and they do it at scale. Um, and if you're on the other side, on the protection side, inventory your APIs, just like the hackers are doing, and test for authentication authorization as much as possible. Um, and at that, I think, uh, I think we're out of time. And so if there's questions, uh, my coworker, um, e, um, Alex, uh, uh, we'll all be in the uh, Slack channel. And if you want to contact Ethan, uh, the mastermind of this presentation, um, and get his tools, feel free to email us uh, at Data Theorem. Um, at this point, uh, I guess we'll uh, hand it back over to the moderator.